Hello, my name is Paul Fairberg. Some of you old timers, timers might remember me. Uh, faculty members at many universities give a last lecture, uh, during which upon retirement in one hour they tell their students all the essential information that they've been teaching them during their career. This is going to be my last lecture, but I don't want to tell you what I think you should do. I'm not even qualified to do that. So many changes have happened since I retired in 2010. I don't think I would know what to tell you. What I would like to do, though, is to give you an idea of what I did during my many years of career as a director of food services, dining services, if you want to call it, and uh, uh, director of auxiliary services, which included food service, housing, and the bookstore. But food service has always been my particular love. And when I opened my own consulting practice in 1964, I, I did it as a food service management consultant for colleges and universities. Now, I, uh, I'd like to tell you what my career was like. I, in 90, when I got my degree from Michigan State, in, uh, I took a job. My first job was director of uh, auxiliary services at uh, Northern Illinois University in DeKalb. Uh, there was a food service director then. She was a wonderful lady, and she knew everything about food service, and I knew absolutely nothing. I think you'll all agree when many of you graduated from college, you didn't know much about the work that you did after once you got started. You lost, learned most of it on the job, and so did I. I was lucky that this lady, instead of resenting my being over her without knowing anything about food service or housing or anything, she felt that she had a partner in this thing. In those days, the women, they were not given the top jobs. And she accepted the fact that I was theoretically over her, but she taught me an awful lot. And so did so the, the dean of uh, women at the time. Uh, that lady, Ruth Haddock, was a lady who had been trained in, uh, in managing uh, uh, women in, on ca college campuses, and she taught me all that I needed to know about housing. So I was very, very lucky to get a lot of information from people like that, and also particularly when I joined the various professional associations to which I belonged. I joined, the, uh, I joined and founded, actually, the, North, uh, the, the NACOS, which is the National Association of College and University Food Service. I joined them in 1959, and later on I joined the Canadian group called CAFSA, and then the, the other group called uh, National Association of College Auxiliary Services. But it was always food service that interested me. But by joining these groups and attending their conferences, their national conferences, their local regional conferences, other meetings, I learned everything that I needed. But I kept, as a young man, I kept asking questions. And uh, uh, I'm sure I made a nuisance of myself, but that's how I learned my profession. Now, I want to tell you in this talk how I dealt with the various groups that I met on campus, like the administrators, the students, the faculty, the food service staff, the physical plant staff, and how I dealt with them. I also want to tell you about some of the areas in which I was particularly interested, uh, whether it was a question of quality or sanitation or temperature. I'd like to talk a little bit about that. And, uh, in addition to all that, I thought you would enjoy it if I told you some of the interesting experiences that I had, little stories I'm going to put in there. They have nothing to do with I'm talking as far as my last lecture is concerned, but I think they're humorous and uh, some are bad and some are good, but I want to tell you them as I go along. So allow me to tell you these stories that have absolutely no connection with what I'm talking about this, this today. So. Let me start by talking to you about the, uh, dealing with the administration. Whenever I had a special request of a dinner at the president's house, for instance, or in one of the VPs, I made it a point to be there personally. I wanted to be there to be sure that everything was fine, including my assistant director, 
we made sure that we, we left the kitchen cleaner than they were when we got there. We made sure that any leftover food was left in the refrigerator of the president's house so, he, so that his or her spouse would have it to use later. And I also made sure that my charges for these dinners were a little bit less than I would normally charge for banquets. Because I knew that the president had a limited budget and he had an awful lot of dinners to, uh, to be in charge of. And I think he appreciated it if I charged him just a little above cost rather than uh, the regular dinner. So that my relationship with the, with the administration were that way. So now let me tell you a little story. Uh, you know, we, I had many different commencements e at the end of each school year. The School of Business, the School of uh, Engineering, the School of Education, and other schools. And we did that over a period of weekends. Uh, every commencement took about two hours, and we had f snacks on the outside of the uh, place where it took place. And then the parents gathered with their students and the teachers, and they talked. And one Saturday, after I had had a luncheon uh, taken care of, I was tired and I didn't have anything that afternoon, so I went to bed uh, for about an hour. But while I was doing that, the School of Education completed their commencement and Dean Jarvis said, and now folks, if you go outside, there'll be some snacks and you can talk and visit. And when they went outside, there were four empty banquet tables because the School of Education had had their commencements on Sundays, and they told us they were gonna do it on Saturdays, and we didn't catch that. And that was terribly embarrassing. And I called the dean the next day, and I tried to apologize, and he, he gave me a frosty answer, and that was it. But I told him that I would make it up to him. And when school started in September, I invited him and all of his faculty to a private dinner, and my managers were the servants, and I appeared in sackcloth and ashes, and I apologized, and they all, they all laughed. And at the end of that year, they got a commencement snack, believe me, that nobody else got, and I didn't charge them for it. And it was a good thing for me, because Dean Sharp has got to be provost. And I mean, we managed to continue a very good friendship after this happened. But that was one of the stories I thought you'd like to know, because it was terribly embarrassing for me. Let me tell you a little bit my relationship with students. Now, when I began in 1952 as director of auxiliary service at Northern Law University, it was a small state college, Northern Law State College. It had about 3,000 students. And I was 19, 29 years old. I was only 10 years old. I was an army veteran, but I was young, but relatively young as an administrator. And I wanted to be more like a bro big brother to them than, than some big highfalutin administrator. So I did all kinds of things that I shouldn't have done. Uh, I took over the concessions and together with some students, I went up and down in the stands doing the football games and I, I had a little big tin in front of me over my shoulder and inside were the hot, hot dogs and I went up together with the students and I was selling hot dogs. Now, a food service director isn't supposed to do that, but I wanted to do that, and it, it is one way I wanted to relate to the students right off the bat, and that's, uh, that's what I did. But when I, in terms of dealing with the students, I watched them, and I tried to sit down with them, and I, I talked to them, and at first I used to say, what do you think about the food? But that's a stupid question for me to ask the students. If they want to say something about the food, they'll tell me. But I, I wanted to know about their courses, I want to know about their teachers. I want to know something about the career plans. And I talk to them as a, as a friend. And that eventually established a very nice relationship. And if, when they saw me again, I'd, say, I'd ask them again, what's their name? I wasn't embarrassed to ask them for their name because after two or three years, I knew their names. And that really made a difference. Because once the student and the administrator know each other personally, a lot of this tension that exists between disappears. And I tried to do that while I was uh, talking to them. Uh, let me tell you two stories, though, in connection with this. Uh, one, was, one was not so good for me, and the other was. The first one happened when I said one year I decided to do something about them. I had three kitchens, and I had a, uh, about three managers and several dietitians on my staff. 
And uh, the managers kept complaining that it's easier in the other, other kitchens that they had too much to do. So one day at a staff meeting, I told them without any advance notice that by next week they were going to be in a different place. Well, that was a mistake. I shouldn't have done that. They should have given some uh, advance warning. They were furious. They were absolutely amazed. And when they were back to their units, they told the students about it. Now, the students, many of them didn't even know them that well, but boy, God, they had a cause now. And pretty soon, Raymond College, which was one of the colleges at UOP, and the students were very intelligent, but they were also a little bit of hippies, and they liked to make trouble. So they picked up the whole salad bar and took the whole salad bar, everything on it, and they brought it to my office and put it on my conference table. And I looked at that and said, why did you do that? You could have come to me without doing that. Well, we wanted to let you know how strongly we felt about our manager. We liked Charlotte Schwinn, they said. I said, OK, first of all, let's make a deal. If you feel so strongly about it, let me have these managers four weeks in the other units, and then you can have them back. Is that OK? Well, most students are fair-minded, and they thought it was a pretty good deal. But before they left, I had them watch when I called a janitor, and I told them to bring a garbage can, and we dumped everything in that salad bowl, salad bar into the, into the garbage can. And they said, what are you doing that? We're going to take it back. <laughs> I said, you're not taking that back. You carried it across the campus, and you spit in it, and you sneezed in it. You're not going to eat that. We're going to throw it out, and you're not going to have a salad bar today. So that was, <laughs> that was the end of that. And I might tell you, when the managers came back to their units after four weeks, they were glad to be there again. So that was a story that was kind of interesting. Now, the other story I want to tell you about is really a, a, I love to tell this story. It has something to do with motorcycles. I hired a young man from New Mexico. He was 23 years old. He was J.R. Allison. He didn't know much about managing a kitchen, but he had a little experience, and I was teaching him the rest. But he was a nice young man. And one Sunday, when I was off, the students at Raymond College decided to let me know what's what, and they drove a motorcycle into the dining room. And they knew if I was there, my God, I'd blow my top and do all kinds of things, which is what they wanted. But I wasn't on duty. J.R. Allison was on duty, and he was 23 years old, and he loved motorcycles. And he got up there, and he saw this beautiful Harley Davidson motorcycle, and he said to the student, boy, is this a model so-and-so? And the guy said, yes. And he said, could I try it? And the student was surprised and nonplussed. And before he knew it, he'd gotten off. And J.R. Allison got into the motorcycle. He drove it around the dining room. And he drove it out of the dining room. And everybody clapped. And the next day, I gave him a big hug and said, I couldn't have done that no matter what. So that's a story I really like to tell, because sometimes you get a break that way. Now I would like to talk to you about how I de dealt with my classified food service staff. First of all, I, I, want, I really tried to treat them the way I would want to be treated. And I did that throughout my career as a food service director. If the food wasn't the way I would like it, I made sure it was the way I would like it. If the coffee wasn't hot, I made sure that it would be hot. And even though some students didn't care whether the coffee was hot, and I'll tell you about that later in temperatures, it was to me important that it was hot because when they were at home they were getting their food directly from their mother right out the range and it'd be on the plate on a warm plate so anyway and so i treat them the way i want to be treated i wanted to show them that i cared about them personally about their about funerals or weddings or other things and and i tried to either give them cakes or food to help them if the, or at least charge them cost now i had to be careful because uh, because I, I later on, uh, you see, I, I worked five years at Northern Law University from 1954 to 1959. And then I worked 20 years at the University of the Pacific. But later on, I spent one year at uh, San Joaquin Delta Community College in Stockton and uh, one year at Virginia Tech. I came out of retirement to do that. The reason I'm telling you that is because when I was at Virginia Tech, I couldn't just give food away because it belongs to the state. And I had to be very careful. I could charge them cost or maybe a little above cost. But to give that away was my freedom at Pacific University. I always felt it was good for the university when I was doing that, not just for me. And I'll talk about that at my conclusion to the, in this talk. But I want you to understand that giving away food or drinks is absolutely appropriate 
particularly since the recipient doesn't always give credit only to food service, but they're glad that they're at the university where that can be done. But you had to do it carefully, and I, that's why I explained what I just did. Um, now, I had something that very few people do. I decided to have staff meetings at each of my three kitchens between 1.45 and 2 o'clock, because that's when the two shifts were meeting, and it got a chance for the managers to talk to their 20 so people at one time, and they would explain to them what was coming up, or the people were asking questions, but at least there was a kind of a little staff meeting. For me, it was also very good because I knew on what day each kitchen had a staff meeting, and between 1.45 and 2, I could go there and talk to them directly without making a big deal out of it. So the idea of staff meetings in every kitchen, even if it's 15 minutes, is something that I really believed and it worked well for me. Now, also in dealing with my full-time people, I learned that I never fired anybody. I never fired anybody. And what I mean is they fired themselves. I didn't fire anybody because I worked very closely with human resources and they taught me about progressive discipline. I didn't know what that was when I got there, but now I know what it is and you all know what it is. You give them verbal warnings, you give them written warnings, you give them more written warnings, you lay them off a few days and finally they fire themselves. And that's the way I did and I worked closely with human resources because I knew that if I messed it up somehow, they would have to pick it up and straighten it out. And so it's much better to have relationships with the human resources before you make a mistake like that. And I had some issues which were very, very, which were very difficult. I had, a, I had somebody who, was, who I was very close to and she was a wonderful person, but she, uh, she had an accident and she started to uh, be an alcoholic and I had to move her to another place. And I, I didn't change her salary or anything. I just moved her and, and that was difficult difficult to do and she ultimately resigned and I helped her get another job in another state. But those are things that you learn the, the hard way and uh, it's one important aspect of my relationship with, food with my regular food service people. I made sure that they all were name tags so that the students got to see the name tags because I wanted the students to get to know them either by their first name or their last name or both, whatever they wanted. But the name tags, including mine, were always very good. And one day, one of the, one of the fine ladies uh, that worked for me in one of the kitchen, she had been around the other units and she left the name tag there. And the meal was just starting. And I, and I said, Lucille, where, where's the name tag? And, uh, Lucy. And she said, oh, I, I forgot it. I said, I want you to go back and get it. She said, now? I said, yes. And boy, she didn't like that. In the middle of the meal, I made her go back and get the name tag. And I knew she was mad. When she came back, she showed me something. She made sure that, the, that, the, uh, that her, her, her apron uh, strings were over the name tag so I couldn't see it. But I, <laughs> I didn't say anything about that. At least I wanted to make a point. And everybody knew on, on my campus that uh, the food service staff wore name tags, and uh, so did I. It's also important, I tried, to, I tried to make sure that when students came into the dining room, first of all, I made sure the dining room was open 10 minutes early because they were always there, no matter whether I opened at 4 or 4.30, they were there early. And I also made sure that we kept it open late, at least 10 minutes late, so if somebody was late, they would still get food. I don't think that anybody should get so technical about if they're gonna open a little bit early and close a little late. It's a gesture towards students that that they should have to understand because this kid was hungry and I was going to feed him <laughs> even if he came late. Now, if, if they did too often, that's another story. Let me tell you about I, my cashiers were always friendly. They, uh, many of them were student cashiers and some of them were full time. But I, I, if a cashier stood there and just took the meal ticket without looking at him, that was not the way I wanted them to treat the students. I want this, each student to feel that he or she was important. Now, maybe I'm saying things that are obvious to everybody, but <laughs> I'm telling it was very important to me. And somehow, I had one of my cashiers, she was wonderful. She sewed buttons on the students' shirts and did all kinds of things because she, she knew them and she liked them. 
Now let me tell you my, uh, my relationship with faculty members. First of all, I wanted to get to know them. They were going to be there longer than the students. If a student was really a, com a problem, I knew that in four years at least he'd be leaving. The faculty members would be there as long as I would. I remember one case where a faculty member sent me a letter. Uh, I, had, I had sent every faculty member uh, an invitation to one of the dining rooms on their birthday. And one faculty member wrote to me and said, I'm not going to I'm not going to use this because I, you raised the price of soup from 90 cents to $1.10, and I resent that. And so I said, my goodness, what am I going to do? So I called the manager who had raised it for $1.10. I said, do you think you could reduce it for, from $1.10 to $1? Could you make out? And she said, oh, yeah. So I made her do it. And then I wrote him a letter, because of you, we reduced the price of soup by 10 cents. <laughs> And that created a friendship. I mean, that's the kind of silly things you have to do sometimes, just in order to keep friends with the faculty. But I tried to sit down with them at lunches. Sometimes I visited if their office, office door was open, just popped in for a minute. I made sure that we got to know each other. Whenever we had special barbecue dinners or, or international dinners, about which I'll talk later, I made sure that they got it at a lower price than, than normal. Uh, and that their kids under 12 didn't pay. And they came, they came to the barbecues, and they came to the international dinners, and they appreciated it. And one more thing I did for them that really was appreciated. I told every one of my faculty members that if they had any children who got to be 16 years old, they would automatically have a part-time job in food service. And believe me, the parents really liked that. Many of their students had never worked and when they worked for me, I treated them well, but I was, I, there was discipline and they had to do it if they wanted to keep the job. So that was something that really created a good relationship. And I became a personal friend with many of them. This, this is not artificial, it got to be that way. These are interesting people, they have interesting careers, they have interesting things to tell me. Talk. I would like to listen to their last lecture, although most of them are not living anymore and they won't be able to hear my last lecture. Now, um, I want to tell you, I want to tell you something that happened that you will also laugh about. The fraternities at uh, UOP used to have a, an evening where they put on skits for the students to watch. Every fraternity had their own skits. And one of them decided the skit would be about Paul Fairbrook. So they got a Paul Fairbrook, so-called, and, and he put a wig on so he'd be a bald head, you know. And they had a student sitting there eating a dinner. And Paul Fairbrook came and said, how do you like the food? And, uh, and he said, you call this crap food? And, and then uh, Paul Fairbrook said, well, tell me, are you on, on a scholarship? And he said, yes. So then Paul Fairbrook took his head and dumped it into the food, and everybody laughed. But I was in the audience, and they saw me, and they said, come on up on the stage. So I came up on the stage, and it was very, very hilarious. And it was, it, again, it's a good example of if you have a nice relationship with these students and you develop this, then you're halfway there, you know? And to me, that was important. Now let me tell you how I dealt with physical plants uh, people. Physical plants, the carpenters, the electricians, the plumbers, they were very important. And I had many times, I had little things to do in either in food service or when I was auxiliary service director also in housing or the bookstore. And there were a lot of little things and I hated to write these work orders for for somebody put a nail in the wall. So I went to the physical plant director and said, let's make a deal. You give me a full-time person, I'll pay his salary, and he's going to be assigned to my department. And I, we won't have to write any work orders. You won't have to worry about him. You're still in charge. I pay his salary. I bought him a truck. I gave him money for spare parts. And that worked out beautifully. And I wrote an article called Everybody needs a Gordon. Mine was Gordon, and if you're interested in the article, you can write for it. Uh, but it's something I highly recommend because it made my job so much better. I had Gordon come to my staff meetings, my management meetings, once a month, once a week. And they came to me, so they knew everything that was going on, and he, if they had problems with him, they would told him what, what needed to be done. And I treated him as if he was one of my managers, and that was the best, best thing we ever did. It's, it took away a lot of this writing orders and everything and all my, and he had spare parts. I even had him buy a spare part for my big dish machine, 
which cost several thousand dollars because I, I knew that I could never be without one and I'd have to wait a couple of months before I get it. So we went to that extent. But remember, when you have a $3 million budget to spend an extra $2,000 on a dish machine motor, it's not such a bad thing. So we did that and, and he and his pickup worked out fine, but if he needed additional help, he went to back to physical plant and usually with some leftover donuts to give to them and they came and they helped. You know, that's what we did with Gordon and it was a very good thing. I recommend it to everybody who runs a large food service to have some sort of arrangement like that. Now I'd like to talk about, not people, but things that I thought were important. And the first thing, the first thing I would want to talk about is quality. Maintaining the highest possible quality in food service is everybody's objective. It's your objective, it's my objective. But just saying that or thinking that doesn't make it so. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, I have a motto, quality, nothing counts but quality. And by what I mean is that if you ever get fired for having spent too much money but you served a very good food service, you'll be able to get another job because they can straighten out the, the financial part of it. But if you served lousy food and you got fired, nobody's going to hire you because you just don't know what you're doing. So I think that, uh, so when I, uh, let me give you some examples. I, uh, when you buy beef, for instance, I, intend, I always specified U.S. choice. Now, U.S. good is a lot cheaper, but U.S. good, good choice is much better. And I'd rather give them some smaller portions, although we were pretty careful about portions. We wanted to give four and a half ounce portions. And I had to train my staff to, to, to learn what four and a half ounces are. Because if I asked you to serve, try that without knowing what you're doing, you might make it five ounces or even six ounces and thinking it was four. So we made sure that we used high quality meat, but it was U.S. choice. And when I had a year one day, a year when I had to reduce all my costs, I cut the portions down from four and a half to three ounces. But they still got good food. And I cared about that, whether it's how many slices per bacon. I'm shocked when I go to the grocery now and the bacon is 30 slices per pound. You, can't eat, you can see through them as you don't even taste them. I like thick slices. Now, I couldn't afford the real thick ones, like 12 per pound, but 18 per pound is what we could do, and you got decent bacon in my place. And our bake shop, we had our own bake shop. We baked fresh bake shop every morning, and the bake shop manager would come at 5 o'clock and want to work for the students, and I told her, Lucille, you don't have to do that. She was a wonderful baker, but she did it. She worked 12 to 14 hours a day, and after I retired and and the food service were turned over to several management companies. Two or three of them didn't work out. And one of them, the first thing he did is to say, everybody, including the managers, have to punch time clocks. And she was so upset about that that she quit. And this guy didn't know what she was losing. But now we have, on my campus, are run by Bon Appetit, and I've had a food service director who's very, very good, and he, he knows how to deal with the people. I'll tell you more about that later. Uh, so we had... When we made baked pies, we only used frozen vegetables. We wouldn't use canned vegetables. If you're going to go to trouble to making a pie, you ought to use at least frozen vegetables, frozen fruit, if you can't use fresh food. And we, we had first class vegetables, and, and we baked. We had many different kinds of bread. Some of them were baked by ourselves, you know, like the, the one that is black and white in the bread, which I think is kind of nice. And, and we did that sort of thing. I always had a bake shop in all the units that I managed, and I, I loved it, I think. And uh, those of you who have your own bake shop are very, very fortunate. And if you think you can't afford it, I might suggest to you that you better look at your budget because you might be able to afford it, and you're better off if you, if you do that. Uh, our bake shop did such wonderful things. And one of the most favorite things were the eclairs, and we baked the eclair forms in advance and froze them. And then when we needed them for a banquet, we would, we would put in the chocolate or the vanilla cream and the chocolate on top. And they were the most popular dessert that I could think of for banquets. And now I'd like to talk to you a little bit about temperatures. Everybody says they want hot food hot and cold food cold. But do you really mean it? Let me give you some examples. To me, if pizza is put on the table 
uh, on a serving line and people can help themselves or they're given one piece of pizza, if that pizza has been there for even five minutes and there's not an overhead lamp that can be brought right down to the pizza and keep it hot, and if that pizza isn't put on something that is hot itself, that pizza is going to be cold. Now, nobody likes, I don't like cold pizza. Maybe their students, some didn't care, but I cared a lot because when they have pizza at home and a pizza place, they get it hot. So I want to be sure the food is hot. And if I had food on the steam tables, I made sure there was hot water in the steam tables so that the, I know we don't use steam tables so much anymore, but when we did, the water had to be hot and steaming. That's why they're called steam tables. And the pans in them had food, maybe 30 portions per 12 by 20 pan. Not any more than that. Some people put in 30 or 40 portions. And in one university that I visited once, they put the food in the steam table at 4 o'clock. They let the employees eat at 4, at four from 4 to 4.30. And by the time the students got there at 5 o'clock, that food was still in the pans. And it, that food was cold by then. And I would... I wouldn't allow that. And I know that at the, the, in Colorado where they feed the Olympic uh, candidates for Olympics, the lady there has a thermometer for every manager and she puts that thermometer in the food, in the steam table itself, and makes sure that it's uh, between 140 and 160 degrees. Now, I didn't go that far, but believe me, I put half pans over the tour by 20 pans so that only half the pan was showing. And the student said to me, but when you take that, it doesn't look as good. I said, listen, son, I want it to be hot, and that's the only way I can keep it hot. And again, I had the, I had the lamps over the steam tables. And uh, to me, it's important. And when they put food, when they put coffee in, in five-gallon or 10-gallon thermos cans, after an hour, that coffee is not hot anymore. And you try it sometime. Some people think, oh, well, I got it in the thermos. It's good for two hours. That's nonsense. All you have to do is try it. It's the same with warm plates. I always had plate warmers, 50 plate warmers in the lower radar. Those units cost about, uh, I think, maybe $1,500 today. But they're well worth it because those plates are warm. They're not hot. They're warm. And if the service felt it was too warm, I'd give them cotton gloves. Here, put the gloves on and serve it. But the plates were warm. Because I found out that when you put mashed potatoes, hot mashed potatoes on a cold plate, the heat from the potatoes gets into the plate and the potatoes get cold. And that's not what I wanted. So I made sure that the food was hot and I made sure that the cold food was cold. I wanted to make sure that on salad bars, if we didn't have a frozen plate at the salad bar itself, at least we had to put shaved ice in it so that the pans of fresh lettuce are sitting on, on a cold I so that everything stays cold. Once I even tried it, I didn't do that too much, but I had a little freezer next to one of the salad bars, so even the salad plates were cold, but uh, <laughs> that was a little too much. But at least you can see that I'm thinking about what is really the best thing I can do. When I saw, on the, uh, just by way of example, at the salad bar, very often the students messed up and put a little of the salad dressing on the trace light. Well, I don't want to be a student who start, goes on that trace light and finds that salad dressing. I made sure that the people in the kitchen, the, in the dining room that worked for me, the people that clean the tables, would wipe that off before the next student got there. And I also made sure they knew how to wipe the tables properly, but that comes to sanitation. I'll get there in a minute. Uh, I wanted the maximum, number, the maximum number of portions per pan is 30, not 40 or 50. And, and uh, at Louisiana State, there was a lady who cooked the vegetables one little package at a time. She, she took three or four two-and-a-half-pound packages, thawed them out, left them in the fridge, and kept baking them as they needed them. That was wonderful. I didn't do that, but it's an example of what people can do to make sure that they don't put too much food in, the, in their places. And let me, little t let me tell you a little story now. We still had football for the first 10 years, and, while, and I was feeding the, the coaches and the, and the uh, journalists up, up at the top of the stands where there was a little uh, place, and I was cooking hamburgers uh, on a griddle, and it was fine, but one day I used an electric griddle, and there were an awful lot of steam came up, and uh, suddenly there's an announcement in the middle of the football game, that's not a fire, that's just Fairbrook cooking hamburgers. Uh, at the same time, once the students asked me if I would put on the mascot uniform, which was a tiger, 
and I became a tiger for the first half of the football team. And then when at the half I took it off, everybody saw it was a food service director, and they thought it was very, very funny. And my wife, I, I had become a widow and married Peg, my present wife, for 53 years. She was new at the time. She was sitting in the stand. <laughs> she didn't know if she was shy or not when she saw her husband coming out of that tiger uniform. But again, it's, this, it's an example of having a relationship with a student that you cannot buy. You have to create it. I, uh, I want to talk a little bit about... Uh, I want to tell you a little story that has nothing to do with anything that except it's an interesting story. My students at Raymond College, I told you about them, they wanted to have a Tom Jones in it because Tom Jones was a movie at the time and the boy and the girl were eating baked, uh, baked uh, turkey legs and... Uh, they thought, it, and they came to the campus, uh, and, I, and I served that. I served it to them, and I was worried about what they had in mind. And I took the pictures of the presidents off the wall because I didn't know what was going to happen. And when I came in, and they were all sitting there with their food, and I came in and I sort of smiled at them. I, I wore a light blue polyester jacket, and then I turned around, and somebody then threw a piece of pepper at me. And I wanted to be a real good Joe. So I turned around and I threw the pepper back at them. And two minutes, two seconds later, I was crawling on the floor. There was more food on me than there was on, any, on the tables. They just waited for that moment. They poured the pitchers of milk on top of each other. And I kept telling, not the milk, please. And that was the end of that Tom Jones dinner. But <laughs> I, I tried to prevent that sort of thing from ever happening again. <laughs> It's a typical thing that happens on a college campus. Okay, let me talk to you a little bit about sanitation. Because sanitation is something that we all believe in, but when you have food poisoning like I had once at Northern Law University, you'll never forget it. Because the Turkey Federation, uh, the National Turkey Federation had come to us to teach us how to bone raw turkey so, that make it, so we can make it so we can slice it like roast beef. And we, we, we all learned how to do that. They came to our campus to teach us. And the next week we tried it and one of the workers had an infected finger and she didn't put a Band-Aid on it and she didn't put a uh, bandage on it and she infected one turkey. And that turkey infected other turkeys. And 12 students got food poisoning. One was even in the hospital. And believe me, when that happens, you don't forget it. I was responsible. Fortunately, I had a very understanding physician on campus and we worked together and we worked it out and I visited the student in the hospital and I apologized and, uh, and of course we never did, we stopped doing that, <laughs> even the boning of the turkeys. But it was, it was something I had to teach my staff that sanitation is important. And when you have anything wrong with anything, you've got to bandage it and you're, and, or not come to work. Um, so that was just a story I thought I would shake, tell with you because it's on my memory and it will never go away. And I kept praying, please, God, don't let me have another food poisoning. And if I saw a rack full of salads with mayonnaise and it was in the, in the kitchen waiting to be used, I said, that rack belongs in the walk-in, and when you need it, you go in there and get it. You don't leave it in the kitchen. They got to know that I would get pretty upset. And in spite of that, you don't always know whether you're doing everything right. I had some friends of mine, colleagues, visit me and ask them to do what's, how much my operation was, and they said, we liked everything, but we found a couple of places which were not sanitary. And believe me, I was glad to hear that. Now I'd like to talk to you a little bit about banquets. Banquets is something that I like very much. All the plates were warm, you can be sure. And I tried to teach my people at night that they should use, uh, they should pour the water rather than put a water pitcher on the table. They should pour the coffee rather than put a coffee pot on the table. And they really had to be sure. And they had, uh, and uh, after a while, uh, many often I gave them hot uh, the cotton gloves, which always made a good impression in Stockton, you know. And uh, but I also made sure that the plates, when they're dished up, they had covers on them. I didn't want to air condition that food while they were going from the kitchen in the dining room. And that's what you, in good hotels you see that. But in many places you don't. Even the food service directors don't care when the food gets air conditioned that way. But I sure don't like that. There were covers on the plates. And, uh, and I like to use students. And I'll tell you, uh, I've, I've always been able to get students. Some of you say I can't find students today. I don't agree with that. If your students 
If you use banquet students separately, they will come. You put notice on the board telling you when you need them. You don't try to find them yourself. You hire student managers, pay them extra money, and let them find the students. And if a student doesn't show up, they go get somebody else. But it's so much nicer to have students from the university as service and some outsider uh, a little older, but there's nothing personal. This way, the, the guests that we have can ask, talk to the students, and it's a much better relationship. Uh, obviously, they all had to wear name tags, and I had to feed them before the banquet because after the banquets, uh, they would eat during the dank banquet if they were hungry, and I'd rather feed them beforehand and after the banquet they could have whatever was left over and share it with janitors. Now, the only thing at, lun at lunchtime, where they only gave us an hour because the people had to start the speakers at 1 o'clock, then we put everything on the table, the desserts on the table, the water pitchers on the table, the coffee pots, because at that point we just wanted to be sure that everybody got a chance to eat everything within an hour, which is not easy to do. Let me tell you a little bit about public relations, because public relations is something that is not so easy, and I happen to write a book on public relations. I'll show you later, uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, you really have to work at it, and you try to, you try to be nice to the editors of the, of the newspaper, uh, of the university newspaper, ours was the Pacific, and whenever I had special dinners, or special, I, I always sent some free passes to the to the editors and the janitors, and very often they were very complimentary, you see. But you have to work at that. And if they, if they say, oh, Mr. Fairbrook is a great food service director, there's nothing wrong with that as long as I made sure that I'm not the only one who gets benefits. And, and for that reason, we had a little, uh, I always mentioned my managers and dietitians who were wonderful. And I used to hire the young dietitians who came right out of dietetic school. They didn't know much about college food service, but they knew hygiene. They knew nutrition, and they were only a few years older than the students themselves, and they made wonderful managers. But, uh, but I also made sure that they got to know my staff, and I made, I'll show it to you, that I made some little posters with a picture of one of our staff members on it and telling what, who they are and what they did. And I put that on every table in all three kitchens, in all three dining halls, so that everybody on campus got to know that person because they, had, they could... Look at the picture that was on the table. And if any employee didn't want that, we didn't force them to do it, but many people liked it. And the students got to know them, said, aren't you the one that I saw on the table? And so that was one way of spreading the good public relations around. Now, sometimes, of course, you, make, you, 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 know, you have a problem. I had a problem because I told my, I decided to have a monotony break in some March when the students get nervous towards finals, and I decided to compare hamburgers with five other places. So I asked my managers to go to McDonald's and A&W and uh, Wendy's and so forth and get 12 hamburgers cooked exactly at 12 o'clock. And we would do the same. And then we set up the tables at the university showing each of these places and having the faculty and staff decided who would, who would be what. Well, McDonald's came out fifth. And the next day I heard that McDonald's, the owner of McDonald's withdrew $25,000 that he was going to give to the university. And I said, oh my God, I went home that night and I said, I hope I don't get fired for $25,000. But I was lucky because the president of the university, President McCaffrey, when he was asked by somebody, he refused to say anything about it. He didn't know anything about it. In the meantime, the owner of McDonald's found out that Time had heard about it. And he didn't want that to be that way. He would have lost, lost a lot more than $25,000 if Time magazine had printed that he came fifth out of city. And he was silly to object in the first place. But anyway, he gave the money back, and I got a call from the president's wife saying, Paul, you're not gonna lose your job. But that was the kind of thing that really didn't work out well for me, and I, and I could have been fired for that. Fortunately, he gave the money back, and, but he never, he never gave us the orange juice that he used to give us. And uh, until I quit, on the day I quit, he started donating <laughs> the orange juice again. Anyway, uh, I have one more thing to say. The food service director has to obviously feel very close to his university or her university. And uh, I think the same thing applies to those of you who have management companies running it. Because if that person is the right kind of food service director, you don't have any problem. We right now have a Bon Appetit, which is doing a very good job, and the manager has been here for 10 years, and his name is Sia, and he's wonderful because he, he's... 
He divides his loyalty between his boss that makes money for them and the university of which he is a part. And so as we are talking about public relations, it's very important that, uh, that we know it. So finally, now, now tell me again how much time I have. Uh, we're at 40, or, um, 45, almost 45 minutes now. Well, if I'm, if I'm a few minutes over, we can always cut yeah. something back. I want to talk briefly about all, all campus and uh, barbecues and international dinners. Uh, the management companies, uh, uh, when they started, they started giving students a steak every Saturday night, and I didn't want it. I did all campus barbecues twice a year. They were outside, they were for everybody. The administrator came because I sent them an invitation. The faculty came because I made it cheap for them to go. And they were real. They were real filet mignons, but they're filet mignon tails, which are not so expensive. And I asked my meat supplier to collect them for me, so I'd have three or four thousand portions when I needed them. And they were very, very popular. And but I also did real international dinners, and I wanted these dinners to be educational. And we did international dinners in Japan and and China and Germany and France and all kinds of countries. And the last one that we did was a pan-Arab dinner because when I retired in 85, being Jewish, I wanted to be sure that my Arab students knew that I cared for them too. So we, but these dinners were much more than just dinners. I called the students in before Christmas and said, when you're going home, may put on a little skit and show it to us. And the best example I can give you is a Malaysian-Indonesian dinner, and we'll, I'll show you what it looked like. We had some Malaysian students that were very close. They came with their wives, and most of them were men. They kept separate. They weren't mixed up with the student. And I called them. I said, when you come back, give us a skit. We're going to give you a Malaysian dinner. And they came back and had a wonderful skit, a kind of a wedding ceremony that they showed. We invited the concerts from, from Malaysia and also Indonesia, and they flew up from Los Angeles. They were very impressed. We showed a video of, of, of Malaysia, and we talked about it and all the American students were in on it so they could see what, not all of them, but there were as many as we could get into the dining room. And so I, afterwards I saw that the student from Malaysia got to be much closer to the other students when they were able to talk about it. And next year we got more students from those countries than we ever did before. So you can see that you can really help the university in doing things like that. And finally, I want to talk to you about the most important thing in my lecture today. Food service has to be such that it contributes to the mission of the university, not to the mission of food service. And some people, some people say, well, this has nothing to do with food service. It has everything to do with food service. When you, think, when you do th things that are good for the university, they're good uh, for you, and vice versa. You have to have excellent food to retain the students. You, you serve sticky rice to students from South America and to Asian students. They don't like Ben size. And, 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 and you use the dietitians and managers as educators so they learn something. On Parents' Day or special dinners for donors, you make sure it's really good. And you made a friend with the development department and also the, uh, the president. Uh, and uh, I'll give you a, a quick example. We had a faculty member, we had a professor, no, I'll give you a quick example. The Department of, the Department of Education asked me to put on a dinner for a Professor Stringfellow Barr, who wrote a book called Big, Strictly Academic. And in his book, he decides our faculty member got a big dinner given to him at a hotel. Pictures of oranges, big scream, uh, bacon and uh, scrambled eggs and everything. And I took that page and I circled it and I put it on the table and I said, menu for Stringfellow Bar. Even the, even the faculty didn't know that. And when the author came and he saw his page, his page being the menu for that day, he was so flattered. And my, the, the faculty didn't, think, didn't know they had a food service director who could read because I had read his book and I knew what it was. Now, that was a real good example of where I could do something different that nobody could expect. So as far as I'm concerned, remember, when food service do what I just said, Food service directors work to help the mission of the university, and if they're given the freedom to do what they need to do, then you will have come, then we'll have done what I hope I did in my last lecture, and I thank you for your listening.